Hello, my name is Sajarita. I'm from India. I'm representing PVR Inox, the largest cinema chain in India. Excellent. So in the 70s, not a lot of Hollywood cinema traveled to India, but The Exorcist did. The head turning, so many people were copying the music. Um, the fandom is on another level for the original film. I guess my question to the both of you is, why are you doing this to yourself? Because it's not just going to be scrutinized in America. This is going to be scrutinized very minutely globally. All of what you're saying sounds extremely appealing to me. Me too. <laughs> sounds fun. <laughs> Let's go. Let's go. So the idea that you could take something that is international, that did have that effect on culture that has reverberated for 50 years, and then to take that epic notion and then bring something really intimate and pure and personal to it is a great as great of a creative and business opportunity as you can find in an industry that that uh, I don't know I just find so so many avenues of a, my imagination starts to open once you say the exorcist that I just I see a blank canvas and it's and it's time to make movies you know Jason I was just doing a random search on the internet to see how many um, spin-offs of the Exorcist people have tried to make. Not How many? Just, not, not the official ones, but there's a yeah. bunch of like, there's a shark exorcist out there. There, there. Oh, which, that's like, there important. I've missed that one. A lot, shark shark, a lot of sharks. Oh, are, oh, there are a lot of possessed sharks out there. Yeah, it just makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah, that was going to be the sequel. Now we're <laughs> we're the out third one, yeah. the shark. Um, but what was it about this script that um, you decided that this is going to be the one that will be the legacy sequel? Well, first of all, we have the rights to the exorcist, so, so that's different than a lot of the other ones. Right, um, um, but uh, but I guess what gave me the confidence to do this is that we had we had a great experience doing Halloween together, doing those three movies together. That's also a an iconic franchise, which there's a lot of fandom. It's very fraught, and so it was it was a great experience to to learn from, and and it it, it allowed I think both of us to kind of tackle this the most iconic horror movie of all time. Um, in 1973, The Exorcist was just blasphemous beyond belief, and we're gonna beep out the next sentence when this interview goes air, goes to air. But like, apologies, a 12-year-old saying your mother's now is was not. People were not prepared for it. In 2023, do you still have the freedom to push your vision that far? You think, as a creative person, that that film did originally? I think you have the creative freedom to do whatever you want, and it's just a matter of how you're communicating with an audience. And I think horror movies owe that to the audience to have that communication. There's, there's a lot of, you could call it desensitization of an audience that you're not gonna make it more provocative or more vulgar or more grotesque than the original. And so that was, those were never on my, my to-do list for this movie. Again, this movie was to make something that was meaningful, that had conversation, that pushed buttons, that, that certainly steps into spirituality and the conflict of, of that. And so that'll inspire its own controversy and conversation, yeah. but it's not there to just piss people off. It's not there. The movie did a brilliant job of, of taking something provocative and making it into brilliant controversy and conversation. We're here to, to, to stand by some of that and see what these negative entities, these unknown negative entities can inf infect these young ladies with and inflict this conflict upon the family but not there just to shock, not just, you know, we're there to scare, make a great entertaining horror movie, yeah. but not just there to upset people and, and make their heads spin. You have to pick up from that. Friedkin said in his commentary that he wasn't making a horror film. He was making a film exploring uh, the mysteries of faith. Exactly. A theological thriller is what he said. And I love standing into that, into that vein of ambition. I think it's really What's important. your interpretation this time now that you're bringing, this, uh, taking the story forward? Right. It's, it's saying that possession that as we see it in this world is, is can be realized in so many forms and you could see that in in not just in demons the way that they we present them in the movie but you could see it in the in the world in your communities in addictions and mental illness and abuse and things and so we're trying to make a very relatable movie and then bring in the horror elements bring in the genre and make something that does bring that unnerving energy that, that Friedkin did so successfully bring that into this movie. Um, Jason, the kind of movies that you've enabled, supported, you've taken a chance on the genre in a very major way. Um, it was, is it safe to say that it, horror is the only genre where you can take a chance on the story without having a major movie star associated with the project? Not for an independent film, but for a, for a studio release, for a wide release. Yeah, it really is. And that's one of the reasons that I love horror is that you can make inexpensive movies mm -hmm. and you can make them, you can use up and coming talent and uh, you can tell subversive stories, and that's why I love horror. 
Now you brought Linda Blair uh, as a consultant on the film. So what was her actual contribution to the the movie? For me, it was just valuable to have a, a very experienced voice, a very opinionated voice in the well-being of these young actresses because that's you know you read the material and it can be very shocking. We read through it with the parents and we had an understanding of where we're trying to go to some very dark and emotional places, and I wanted them to be able to express that with authenticity and authority. And, and Linda just gave us a, a, a set of tools to do that respectfully of, of who they are and how to step away from that and how to heal and how to spend your weekends uh, uh, clearing yourself, cleansing yourself from those, those creative impulses that we had during the week. A lot of the lore around the 1973 Exorcist exists around the stories behind the film, what went on, how they got the voices right, how they got the special effects right back in the day. Um, what has been the most exciting thing for you now that you're making this film with all the technolo technology available to you? The most exciting thing is just getting a community of actors together and, and a, a, a great artists and technicians behind the scenes and, and being able to take everyone's the truth of behind everyone's spirituality. You know, we're, we're, we're a movie that's dealing with varied theologies and spiritual beliefs, but then when you get onto set and everybody has their own, that we created energy that was really specific, really unique, and there weren't any events like you hear uh, of the original film. We never had anything that specific, but there was a really unique creative energy, and, and we tried to turn that into a creative opportunity for all of us. Uh, Jason, the world has just recovered from a pandemic. Everybody's already kind of, you know, on the edge of their seats all the time, constantly just kind of worried a little bit, a little bit more than we were in 2019. Now, when you make a horror movie like this, what is it that you're keeping in mind for the audience that has just recovered from this two year long real life horror and you're bringing them back into the theaters to show them another horror film? Well, I think one of the weird things about human beings is that when there's bad things in the world, horror movies become more popular because I think it's a way of seeing something bad that's totally within your control. So there's a real, so horror movies in some way are healing when there have been these horrible events. So that's something I definitely think about when we embark on our, uh, on our post, post pandemic movies. But does it like, do you, are you thinking in your heart a little bit that, you know, people have already gone through so much stuff. Are we going to tone this down? Are we going to really like go at no, it? No, we're going to go at it, but a we're going to do it, but about different things. You know, I think no one wants to see a horror movie about a pandemic, but I think we, when you're making a horror, I said to David, make it as intense as you possibly can. People will like it better. I find that people who like horror movies are better adjusted individuals. They are. In, in we're all happier. We're yeah. happier and better adjusted. And you know what else is true, which David will tell you, the set of a horror movie generally is much more fun than the set of a comedy. True or false? That's true. And one other thing is I haven't had a bad dream since I started making horror movies because I get, there I purge myself of all that negative energy during the day at work. And so I have sweet, funny, hilarious, <laughs> <laughs> Happy dreams. Happy dreams. I didn't have any opportunity to have any dreams last night because I barely <laughs> slept two wings. <laughs> Lastly, Jason, because I'm being told to wrap up, uh, three reasons why people should go to the biggest movie screen they could find in this city and watch your film. It's, it's the most intense, visceral, exciting experience you'll have or you will have had in a long time. David, same question. India, lots of fans of The Exorcist. I say the bigger the screen, the louder the volume, and go and scream your head off and have a good time at the movies. <laughs> and go, go on a date. Hold hands. And go on a Hold date. Hands. Bring a friend. <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen. This was great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much.